Welcome everybody, this is Brother Frank of the Rim McCall, and glad to be here with you tonight. Uh, it is October the 22nd, 2020, and we are truly living in perilous times. This is supposedly the last presidential debate. It is uh, getting ready to happen here uh, very shortly. And uh, folks, we are seeing now that this country is headed towards a time of violence if one party doesn't get their way, they are threatening right now to bring violence and not just I'm talking about throwing stones and everything. We're talking about guns radically armed because we are living in such a wicked world right now that even the Pope has who I am not Catholic. I don't follow anything. I don't believe in and Catholicism, I'm not against people that are Catholic, but I don't believe in the Holy See. But I do know this, that he just announced this week that they he is wanting them to officially have civil unions for homosexual uh, relationships. That was something thought to be unheard of coming from the highest levels of the Catholic Church. And it is a reminder to me that not only is the spirit of Antichrist or the Antichrist himself has no love for women, it doesn't desire women, but it is a truth that we are living in the days of Lot. And folks, if you are Catholic, you need to pray to the Lord and ask God about the truth that is in his word. Um, don't please do not get upset with me. Uh, I will tell you this. Do not trust any man, any priest, any church system. Only trust the Lord Jesus at this moment in this hour in earth's history. If you want to be safe, because if they are saying stuff like that, you better look out. God calls it an abomination. It is not right. It is a sin against creation because there are saying I no longer want to create with homosexuality. That is not the God that we serve. He is a creator God, and we are needed to wake up to the hour that we are in. But we have seen the corruption of what is going on with the federal government, with the Hunter Biden scandals and the emails and his father. Folks, it's this is no bombshell. Truly, this has already been known. All this stuff is known. Our federal government doesn't care about us. They care about power, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So here's my advice to you. Do what the Lord says. Quit believing and thinking that if you just vote right, that this country will change and everything will go back to being normal. That is not the case, because I don't care if Donald Trump wins, who wins, doesn't matter. As long as we keep continuing to promote the homosexuality, uh, abortion, I mean, the amount of abortions, they talk about Black Lives Matter and, and the people that have been killed. What about the million, almost one million babies in this country alone every year? It's like 900 some thousand that are killed. And we what about those lies? Do they matter? Well, I'll tell you what, they matter to God. And unfortunately, the God of the United States is the God Moloch. And we are burning and sacrificing our children in the hands of Moloch, the God of prosperity, because these children are hurting people's prosperities. And I've seen pictures of people standing there saying, holding them up, saying they're glad they're going to hell. I pray the Lord have mercy and wake those people up. They have no idea what they are saying. Folks, you don't ever want to end up in that place, and God doesn't want you to go there, but you sit and boast against the Most High. Folks, I am warning you right now, wake up, and people that are doing this stuff, oh, I know we want to see them just, you know, they get we get us so frustrated, but folks, we've got to pray sometimes for those that even, they just look like they're completely gone, because I'm telling you right now, even though this hour is a, is a mess, God is still saving people at this moment, and I'm telling you, we are going to see salvation like we have never seen in the history, I believe, of this country, not because we're going to have a revival of our government, but I'm talking about the kind of revival that comes out of absolute persecution to the people of God. They have tried to persecute the Chinese church. They have tried to kill the Chinese, and every time they do that, the church just grows more and more and more, and God is going to grow His church, His true 
believers, the true Israel, all Jew and Gentiles who both are joined in to Jesus, Yeshua as Savior. He will save them to the uttermost of the ends of this earth. So my question is, what are we going to do about it? What are we as believers going to do about it? Well, I'll tell you what, folks, we need to make sure that we are getting our lives in order at this moment. And truthfully, folks, there's so much spiritual baggage that has been carrying around by so many of us, so many in the remnant, so that people are struggling. We we have been blessed. God has led us through uh, some fasting times and seeking his face and the days of awe. It's been such a blessing. But there are still so many people that are struggling to get free. And we're going to talk about that tonight because I can't stress to you right now, there is not enough tuna fish in in the can. There is not enough water that you can store up. There is not enough physical preparations in this flesh that will possibly prepare you. You can dig an underground bump bunker 200 feet underground with five years of supplies and it will not be enough to survive what is coming upon the ends of this earth. Only God himself can can save. Let's pray. Father, in the name above every name, Yeshua Jesus, the Messiah, we pray, Father, that you would hear our cry for this hour, that as your believers, as your people, Lord, as your children, God, that we would be listening to what our Father is asking for us to do in this hour, Lord. Please guide us, Lord, bestow us with the spirit of of discernment, Lord, so we can discern truth from error as we go into these last days, Lord, that we will be seen clearly, knowing that we are on the right path because our God is leading us. Lord, I pray for our family members that don't know you, that you would touch them, that you would use us to reach them, to reach others, Lord, and we wouldn't forget the Great Commission that doesn't end just because chaos is coming. The Great Commission is till the very end of the earth that we shall reach out and speak speak and preach that everlasting gospel. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, the truth is we are living, as I said early in some, earlier, in some perilous times. And, and yet we are so many people that are struggling. And for those of you that were in the days of awe, at the end of it, we made a commitment. And if you weren't there, you can still make this commitment now that we would spend one hour in the morning with the Lord. And I'll tell you, folks, that is a game changer. But I want to share a quick experience that happened to me. Last Sabbath, the Saturday uh, that we just passed, I had uh, there was an explosion here close to where I lived. It was a uh, they say it was a gas leak, whatever. I don't know. Uh, it was a terrible explosion. It was heard uh, w- far away and um, and in town. And, and it, it, I woke up that morning and I and I was going to do my normal uh, devotion with the Lord in prayer and reading His Word, but I got distracted that morning. And I, I got distracted with the, what was going on in the news, and, and it got me off my, my time. And I'm going to tell you, I paid a price that day for it. And not a price of punishment, but a price of emptiness. You see, when you let yourself go, after a while, your conscience doesn't bother you. You get out of praying and seeking the Lord for a while, and you kind of just begin to go. And it doesn't, you don't notice how much you're missing. But once you start getting in and spending that time uh, with the Lord, and you're dedicating that time to God, and then all of a sudden you pull off, it is like swimming through sand. It is like walking in the middle of the desert without any water. I was emptied and I paid a price for not spending that time in the morning with the Lord. I don't ever want to make that mistake again because I saw the value so much that day of what it means to spend time with the Lord because at the moment I didn't spend that time. I'll tell you what, I don't want to go back to that again. So I want to encourage those people who maybe weren't there or those of you who made the commitment. Listen, you might have fallen off the bandwagon. Get back on. God doesn't care. Well, he does carry, but he, he it's not so much that we fell off. It's that we get back on and we keep riding. We keep going down the path and we keep on the race. It, you know, we are going to get knocked from side to side from time to time, but we get back on. If the person that is in the morning, to, the person said that they were going to go to the vineyard and they don't to go work. And then later on, they change their mind. They're due. God still be- rewards that person. But those who say they will and they start, but then they never do. Well, you, if you know the Bible, you know what happens. 
God is calling us in this hour to get rid of that which is holding us back. And I'm going to tell you the first step, spending that alone time with God. I want to read a story. I, I just... I think I shared this story a few years ago, but it's one that just it hits me so hard because it's so true right now. As in 1845, the ill-fated Franklin expedition sailed from England to find passage across the Arctic Ocean. The crew landed their two sailing ships with a lot of things they didn't need, a 1,200-volume library, fine china, crystal goblets, and sterling silverware for each officer with his initials engraved on the handles. Amazingly, each ship took only a 12-day supply of coal for their auxiliary steam engines. The ship became trapped in a vast frozen plains of ice. After several months, Lord Franklin died. The men decided to trek to safety in small groups, but none of them survived. One story is especially heartbreaking. Two officers pulled a large sled more than 65 miles across treacherous ice. When the rescuers found their bodies, they discovered that the sled was filled with tableware silver tableware those men contributed to their own demise by carrying that which they did not need but don't we so often do the same things those men could have potentially survived and gotten much farther had they not drug all that silver with them but they carried it anyways and we do so often the same things when we drag this baggage through life that we don't need evil thoughts that often hinder us, bad habits that drag us down, grudges that we won't let go of, forgiveness that we will not forgive. And I'm going to tell you right now, that forgiveness, it's something that you need to reread in the Bible when it says, forgive us as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. There's a com- conditions in that, and you need to read that. God has forgives, uh, forgives us. He calls us and demands we forgive others. And, folks, when you begin to forgive, I'm telling you, it not only frees you, it frees the person who you held the grudge against also. Hebrews 12, verse 1 says this, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Spiritual baggage. Excess weight. Things that drag us down, even us as believers who listen to the remnant call, who are tr- following the Lord, we get bagged down, bogged down with baggage. And folks, there's many. I'm just going to speak to you plainly right now. There are many of you out here who are looking for the return of the Lord, know that tough times are coming, begin to prepare, and before you know it, you know that things are coming and you feel like you've already gotten sidetracked. That's the devil. And he's trying to bog us down with the cares and the things of this world that put it, drag us into the pit. Yet we love to carry this luggage on our spiritual journey because in a weird way, it brings us comfort. Old habits, past trauma, unforgiving hearts, our jobs, living arrangements, secret sins, open sins, other people's sins, living with people we shouldn't be living with, in relationships, living with people we shouldn't be doing outside of marriage. But yet we somehow find ways to justify it, even though we know it's wrong, because it in a really weird way brings us comfort. We have a bazillion excuses, reasons as to why we need to carry this stuff. And for many, it's never our fault. It's always someone or something that makes us carry this baggage around with us. One book I was reading, there was a lady that was saying that the reason she drank, she was so drank was because she was so miserable, that she only drank because she was miserable. Finally, someone had the courage to tell her that she didn't drink because she was miserable. She was miserable because she drank, and it finally clicked in her brain, and they were right. Folks, sometimes we have created a false narrative in our own mind to justify that which is wrong to bring us comfort and use that as an excuse as to why we do something. But what is it today that is weighing you down, brother and sister? What is it that you're carrying around that is so absolutely just wrecking your life? 
If there was something you could cry out to God right this second and say, God, please take this from me, what would it be? John chapter 5, starting in, uh, in verse 1, or verse 5, excuse me, says this, And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Well, let me actually back up to verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and that Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folks, and blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first at the troubled water, the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So imagine this scene, folks. People are sitting around. They've been in bondage all these years, physical ailments, spiritual ailments, whatever it is, blind, they can't see, whatever it is that's, they're sitting around waiting for once, only one time a year for an angel to come down. And here's this man, the Lord's going to talk about, he's been sitting there and waiting for him. In verse five, it says, and a certain man was there, which had an infirmity 30 and eight years. Could you imagine? Imagine 38 years he's been suffering. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The important, the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. So here the man is. This is how bizarre this scenario is. He's sitting there waiting for the angel to come stir the water and knowing he doesn't even have anybody to put him into the water. So he's waiting for a miracle that in his mind he knows is impossible for him to take part of, but he's there hoping for it anyways. And in reality, he knows it will never actually happen happen. I wonder how many people are in the same boat. They've heard the stories of God. They've heard that he can heal. They heard that he delivers, but in their mind, they believe that there's no way that God would ever do that for them. So they're sitting waiting for a miracle that they don't even believe could ever even happen because they're waiting for somebody else to come and put them into that situation that'll have a miracle or maybe some false prophet prophesy over them or maybe some pastor speak a word and then they'll be healed. But the truth is that is not going to happen. Verse 8, Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. So here the man was standing there. Jesus was right in front of him. His miracle was there that day. And all he could do is sit there and tell the Lord how there was nobody that could actually heal him. Even though he knew miracles were being done here, he had no one that could actually help him. And God himself was standing right in front of that man. Folks, do you understand how often the Lord himself has been begging, saying, hey, wait, here I am. Here I'm ready to do something. I'm ready to make a change in your life. And we're looking around saying, where's God? I can't see him anywhere. And the Lord's there the whole time. Folks, I'm convinced there are times we don't even understand that God himself is right there. We don't even see it because we have been trained to look to somebody else to perform a miracle for us instead of the Lord. Jesus was right in front of the man, and he couldn't even see him. And yet God healed him anyways, because he had no idea who he was talking to. Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 3, says this, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasure, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy has saved us by the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So here the Lord speaking through Paul, the book of Titus talking about how ignorant and foolish we are, deceived, serving our diverse lusts and pleasures. 
But not by the works of righteousness is God going to save us. No, not by anything that somebody else is going to do. But he himself, through the washing and the regeneration and the new of the Holy Ghost, which he has shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so some of us are sitting here listening and saying, Lord, this is me. I'm carrying around all this baggage and I hate it. I want freedom and I don't know what to do. So what do we do? Some of us have been carrying around this baggage our entire lives. And it's been for so long that we're afraid to get rid of it because it has become a comfort to us. Turn with me to the book of Acts. If you have your Bible, chapter two, starting in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, you need to remember the context. Peter just preaches one of the most blistering sermons. You might not catch it when you're reading it, but it's blistering. He tells the people, you're the ones who have crucified the Lord. He comes, he, he lets them have it. And when he lets them have it, no, they didn't respond in anger. They were pricked in their hearts because the Holy Spirit was empowering that sermon that Peter was preaching. And they said to him, what shall we do? And Peter makes it so simple. He doesn't say go and buy a book on the five better ways to this. He doesn't say go donate a thousand dollar seed to some crazy ministry. He doesn't say to go listen to some woman prophetess that's going to give you some false prophecy. He doesn't say do that. He says simply repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation who afterwards devoutly and charitably conversed together, the apostles working many miracles and and God daily increasing his church. Then they, then, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. You see, it's so simple. Repent and be ye baptized for the remission of sins. Folks, God is saying, listen, I'm going to make this so clear. If you're struggling, you're falling behind, you're messing up, you're having issue, it's time to repent. And folks, listen, I'm a believer in baptism by immersion, 100%. If you've never been baptized and you want to give your heart to the Lord, please, folks, I believe you get baptized. You may say, well, what about the thief on the cross? Listen, folks, I'm not talking about if you never had an opportunity and you're on your deathbed and you can't get baptized. I'm not talking about that. That's a different scenario. I'm talking about if you have the opportunity to go down into the waters of baptism and surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you need to do it. God has called us to it, and his way is always the best way. Don't try to figure a different way around it. Just do what the Lord says says the truth is no matter we have all sinned each one of us have a plethora of ways that we have contributed to the crucifixion of Jesus we are all guilty of the Lord hanging on the cross but today there's new methods of how we can get free and what we can do but really the truth is it's it's only Jesus repentance and and baptism, it's a part of our steps and being after repenting that is a part of this salvation and getting free process that God has for us. You know, it's like today so many people love to preach Christ without a cross, forgiveness without sacrifice, and restoration without propitiation. And if you don't know what propitiation is, it's the act of appeasing the wrath and conciliation, the favor of an offended person. 1 John 2, 2 says this, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus laid down his life, folks, because of our sins, to turn his Father's wrath away from a deserving people so that we could have a chance to turn our lives to him and dump all of this spiritual baggage. But because 
we are afraid so often of repentance because we feel some we, some weird reason. We feel that often if we go too deep, if we allow God to examine us too deeply, that that we'll pay a heavy price. And 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 folks, why would you think that God would ever want to hurt you? Don't be afraid to go deep. Sometimes that pain we receive, we feel when God goes deep is simply him um, is exposing our sin so that we can repent and get free from it. Repentance is not a bad word, but it's something we should embrace because God wants to set us free. Unfortunately, though, repentance is something that is so often feared by so many We've made it a bad word in the postmodern age that we live in where everything is nice and we we need never step on people's toes. Folks, repentance is a gift from God, not to be feared, but it is a way for you to take all of your baggage, all of your garbage, and lay it down at Jesus' feet so that he can free you to walk in true joy and happiness instead of heaviness of burdens and constant torment. Yes, there is some pain sometimes in repentance, and yes, it can hurt. But if we are willing to let God dig deep into the bottom of our hearts to let go of the sins of this world, to forsake our past and follow him, he will take this baggage and throw it along with all of your sins into the ocean so you can walk in peace with him. God is looking to wipe your slate clean. He enjoys forgiving sins because that is another person saved in the kingdom and not lost to the enemy and God doesn't want or plan on losing any but you have a right to choose but I'm going to tell you right now the Lord will throw the actual kitchen sink no matter what he's got to do to make sure that you are in his kingdom. The Bible says simply this, only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God. God didn't say you had to you had the strength to overcome. He didn't say you had the strength to get free on your own. He is asking today if you are willing to let go. Are you willing to forsake your sins? Are you willing to cry out to him? Folks, if we are living in sin, we need to stop it. You might not be strong enough. You might not be strong enough, but God was specific when he said, return you backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. The Lord knows you're not strong enough. He knows you can't do it on your own, but he says, return unto me and I will heal your backsliding. God says the healing part is his job. You see, so often we talk about, we got to fight and do all the, I'm telling you folks, you got to learn how to let it go, release it and let God have the victory over it. The Lord said he would heal your backsliding. And you need to say, Lord, I read in Jeremiah 3, 22, where you said that you would heal my backsliding, Lord, if I would just confess and come to you, that you would heal it. Because, folks, God wants to heal you and set you free. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat with the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now, when the Pharisee's Uh, Now, when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering him. Now, remember, this guy was thinking inside of himself, but Jesus knew what was in his heart. And Jesus answered him, said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And then they had nothing to pay. He frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? For Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom forgave most. And he said unto them, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? 
I entered into thine house. Thy gave me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. So here this woman, who is a terrible, wretched sinner, her, her reputation was known. They were even accusing Jesus, how dare him? If he would have really know who this woman, if he was a true prophet of God, he would have known. But he knew exactly who she was. But the reason why she was forgiven. You see, folks, this is such a point to understand. Or should I say the reason? I didn't mean to say it like that. Let me say it like this. This woman, because she hath been forgiven so much, she loved so much. But folks, when you have not been forgiven, you will not love very much at all. You see, if you don't allow God to forgive you, if you don't allow God to see your sins and let them be exposed, here this woman was, she'd lost all reputation. She was falling down at the very mercy of Jesus' feet. She was weeping and crying out, and God sees her. She's a disaster, and he's willing to forgive her. And out of the gratitude of her heart, she loves and so thankful. You see, folks, when we haven't been forgiven much, we don't have much to be thankful for. But this woman knew and understood that she had been forgiven for so much and that she loved so much because she was so thankful. And folks, I sometimes I realize that there is so much anger in this church is that we attend, in this world that we are living in, by those who call themselves Christians. You know why? Because they've never truly allowed themselves to be forgiven because they've been unwilling to allow God to expose them for who they are and forgive them for their sins. You see, true repentance leads us to the feet of Jesus. It leads us to safety. And even though the church, like the Pharisees, may condemn you, and even though the world may condemn you when you're in Christ, when you are at the feet of Jesus, the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. At the feet of Jesus, when you come with all everything open and lay it all out before him, there is not a devil, there is not a pastor, there is not a self-righteous person who can condemn you before the Lord because when you fall at the feet of Jesus, you are falling at mercy. Folks, it's true. The Heavenly Father, the Bible says that He sits inside the Heavenly Temple. It's in Revelation. The Bible says that His footstool is the mercy seat of God. So if you fall at the feet of our Lord, you are falling at mercy. Folks, God is able and willing to forgive today and free you from the spiritual bondage that is binding so many people. And as we go to this last hour, you begin to feel this bondage weigh so heavy because the devil is trying to attack. But God is also weighing on our conscience, letting us know it's time to release it. And we release it through repentance, seeking him, falling at his feet, and then letting him forgive us. A little boy visiting his grandparents was given his first slingshot. He practiced in the woods, but he could never hit his target. As he came back to Grandma's backyard, he spied her pet duck. On an impulse, he took aim and let that rock fly. The stone ended up hitting the duck right in the head, and he fell dead. The panicked boy desperately hid the duck in a wood pile, only to look up and see his sister watching. Sally had seen it all. But she said nothing. After lunch that day, Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. But Sally said, Grandma, Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen today, didn't you, Johnny? And then she whispered to him, remember that duck. So Johnny did the dishes. Later, Grandpa asked if the children wanted to go fishing. Grandma said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help make supper. Sally smiled and said, that's all taken care of, Grandpa, don't worry. 
Johnny wants to do it. Again, she whispered, remember that duck. Johnny stayed, and while Sally went fishing, after several days of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally's, finally he couldn't stand it. He confessed to his grandma that he had killed the duck. I know, Johnny, Grandma said and gave him a hug. I was standing at the window and saw the whole thing. And because I love you, I forgave you. I wondered how long you would let Sally make a slave of you. Folks, we are no longer slaves to sin. Come to God now. Confess your sins. Cry out to him and let him take this baggage away. And as we enter into these last days in earth's history, we can live in freedom, knowing that we've been freed from the sins of this world and that which is binding us. I don't care what you've done wrong, how many sins you've done, how many broken promises you've, you've, you've done, how many times you've failed the Lord. The Bible says simply, if you will come and you confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Folks, God is waiting in this hour to set us free so that we can be useful for him as we move into the last days. We are not to live in cower and fear, but we are going to move forward in power and the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of his resurrection so that we can be uh, in his army in these last days to save the lost because God is coming soon to get his people. Folks, we are living in the last days. And this spiritual baggage, it's not from the Lord. It's from the devil. And God wants you to set it free and release it and allow him to forgive you and believe the promises of God when he says that he has cleansed you to believe that you're cleansed. When he says that he's forgiven you to believe that you are forgiven and then walk in the power and the promise of his forgiveness so that you can live holy. Don't wait another minute. This is Brother Frank on the Remnant Call encouraging everybody out there, keep pressing in, keep fighting. Our God is in the business of saving, and it is now, and we cry out to him. He is faithful and just to forgive. God bless and shalom. Trumpet in Zion, sounding on the mountains. Blow a trumpet in Zion, for the day of the Lord is come. Blow a trumpet in Zion.